Hi, I'm Michael Cashew. And I'm Adi Cashew, and you're listening to The WAG Podcast. This podcast is about health, wellness, and personal development. Each episode is a short conversation between Adi and I on a single topic with actionable steps. We cover everything from food, mindset, fitness, and relationships. We started WAG because of the way health and fitness changed our lives, so we hope to share a tool or two that helps you along your way. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Adi, welcome. Welcome. Guys, today we have a very exciting episode for you. We're going to talk all about sex. So we did, we've done a lot of relationship podcasts on the Brute Strength podcast, and we've already done a couple on this show. Mm -hmm. And we did one or two specifically about sex on the Brute Brute Strength podcast. And we got so much engagement. So many people were just so grateful that we talked about it. And yet I find it kind of funny that we're talking about it here because you're you're always so you never want to do anything controversial so I don't really find this controversial though talk about that I think I don't think this is controversial I think everyone I mean most people most people like far 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 majority of people are having sex Mm -hmm. want to have sex say that it is important for their relationships uh, it is something like when you talk to couples that have been together forever and ever and ever, it's an important piece of what has made them successful. Um, and so it's something we're all doing. It's something we all want to do. It's something that helps us be healthy and happier. So I feel like it's only controversial because people don't talk about it, but it doesn't make it like, like it's not controversial in the sense that someone's going to argue that it's important. Mm-hmm. It's important. So I don't, I don't mind crossing the boundary of having the conversation because I'm very comfortable with my own sexuality and ta- we can talk about our sex life openly. So yeah, we will. Yeah. So I'm totally okay with that. Um, I think the only controversial thing is that most people don't talk about it, which I feel like right. this this platform can allow us to change that so that it is less controversial because I don't think it should be. I don't think it should be as controversial as it, as it is. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's controversial. It's definitely, it's taboo, yes. right? And it's taboo because in our society, there's so much shame around sex. And a lot of that comes from religion. A lot of that comes from media. And it's just not something that in w- at least Western culture that we talk about a lot. However, it is one of the most meaningful parts of our lives. And it's something that we need help with a lot of times. Uh, it's something that ideally we should be able to lean on our community and our support system for just for to have an ear or to to hear how other people are doing it what's working for them what's what not working for them totally and so hopefully this conversation uh helps with that Mm -hmm. and the reason specifically that we're talking about it today is to be very vulnerable about it um well i'll give you a little bit of context adi and i have been I don't know, blessed or uh, we're very grateful that we've had an incredible sex life for our entire relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, However, in the past six months, we've gone through a couple different periods where we've had much less sex. And so we've gone through periods of judging ourselves, judging each other, thinking, you know, am I not enough in this relationship? Am am I not sexy to you anymore? Am Am I not novel? And so it's been a bigger topic of conversation in our relationship. And I think we've uncovered some new things that are not mind blowing to anyone, but hopefully by hearing our stories about what we're doing, um, it can help someone listening. Perfect. So the first, the first, let's give uh, we have like four big takeaways for this show, but first let's, let's give a little bit of context about sex in the first place. So, there's this lady called Esther Perel, who, mm-hmm. we, who we really, really look up to. She's one of the world's foremost thought leaders in relationships in general. She's one of the best relationship therapists in the world. And she talks a lot about the difference in connection and love versus desire, desire and sex. And so she talks about these things as being on different sides of a spectrum. Right, things that make us connected and in love, 
things like safety, safety, security. talking more, spending more time together, uh, building trust, et cetera, are in a lot of ways the, the opposite in opposition to what creates desire and um, kind of arousal, which are <clears throat> novel experiences, um, the unknown, uncertainty. <clears throat> and so one thing that she said years ago that really struck me is that in today's age, marriages or partnerships are actually more in love and connected than ever, which was mind blowing because our divorce rates are so high mm -hmm. throughout the world. They're more connected and in love than ever, but their sex lives are worse than ever. Mm. And one of the reasons that she talks, maybe the biggest reason she, she her, her theory, one of the biggest theories that she has for this is because <clears throat> there's no more polarity in relationships or, or we have less polarity. And what polarity means is the dynamic between the masculine energy and feminine energy. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this on the Brood episode. This does not mean male versus female at all. All yeah. of us have masculine, all of us have feminine, mm -hmm. but we each have our own kind of core energy. Yeah. I like the way that um, a friend of mine described it. She Instead of using masculine and feminine, feminine, which can really wrap your mind in male and female, like it's really mm -hmm. hard to separate those, uh, she used the words flow and go. So masculine would be go, go mode, and then flow would be more feminine. Um, and we all have moments of being in flow and all have moments of being in go. Mm -hmm. give, give me some examples of what, what kind of activities and mindsets go in each of these categories? Yeah, so flow would be more being and go would be doing. So if I'm just like being, relaxing, just not progressing in some way, that is being What are more, some of the ways that you just quote unquote be? Be would be um, sitting, meditating, meditation, sitting, going for a walk and without – you know, listening to a podcast or mm -hmm. on a phone call or trying to get something done at the same time, mm -hmm. um, sitting in our backyard and just appreciating the nature. That would be just being. And then doing is working, um, meetings, progressing in the business or um, getting things done around the house. Like that type of stuff is more doing. Yeah, it's, it's funny how I do this for sure, but I think a, a lot of people listening can relate. We turn a lot of these like flow type of activities into go activities mm -hmm. by constantly being plugged into technology. So I went through a long, like years of whenever I would be on a walk or even when I would do something like Ramwad or I'm in the car, I'm always plugged into an audio book or mm -hmm. a podcast. And what I realized over time is that I had no time to just decompress and be in that, what you're calling flow mode. Right. And then in that flow mode is was where a lot of like your best ideas and opportunities come. And if you're just like always focused and driven and going, then you don't have the opportunity to step back and see a new path or see mm -hmm. a new opportunity mm -hmm. um, so you do want a healthy balance of both um, and like you were saying each person has like a core flow or go we all have both but one person like you have one that is at your core and the polarity is what creates eroticism and desire so like think you, about like bat like a like a uh, like magnets right right you need opposite Whatever. I don't know what those things Positive are called. Negative <laughs> Positive negative. For them to stick to each other. Um, <laughs> charges. Opposite charges. Opposite charges. Yeah. So um, having the flow and the go, you are definitely go at your core. Mm -hmm. I am flow at my core, but I'm often in go mode. Like I run my own business. I'm, I have very a staff. Driven. I'm very driven. I'm very ambitious. I'm working out. I do like lots of things that are go, 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 go. Uh, and that can often – like not have the pull of desire because you're also in go, go, mm -hmm. go. So it just doesn't have as much desire or eroticism in terms of our sex life. Right. So in a relation, in the context of a relationship, the goal is to have this love and connection, trust and safety, but also to be able to have moments or, or, periods of time where you you bring that polarity back into your relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's I don't think it's possible to constantly be in perfect balance with that. No way. But you can certainly insert things into your life that help you bring that polarity and back. 
that it is important like in order to have a lifelong relationship with somebody you want to have a love and connection and safety and security and trust like mm-hmm. that's what we're all after as well um the what i learned from esther perel that actually changed my the game for me on this was the more you go to like love connection trust safety the more that person becomes more like a family member to you and that like naturally feels less sexy Mm -hmm. because most people don't want to have sex with their family members right so it's it's ancestral you don't want to do that um so when your partner becomes more like a family member your desire to have sex with them goes down oh i got Um, cramp (laughs) i keep going yeah your desire to have sex with them goes down and then the what what we're talking about right now of increasing that desire and the uncertainty and the mystery is hopefully inserting moments where this person is no longer your roommate or a family member. They're um, somebody that you want to have sex with. Just like at the like at the beginning of your relationship, most people want to have sex all the time because you just don't know this person. Mm-hmm. They, there hasn't been that level of security and trust. So everything is really uncertain. Right. So the four things that we're going to talk about are about how to increase the level of polarity in your relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually love... Uh, this might be a little out of turn, but I love what uh, our friend Shannon talked about last night at, because it's so prevalent in our relationship at times, the meeting of the masculine. So both of us are together. so driven and, uh, you know, we're working together constantly. And so we have to put on our masculine hats, mm-hmm. right? The and go s- mode. Right. And the go mode. And it it wouldn't be completely out of the question for us to just constantly be in this masculine go mode all of the time because we ha- we're constantly getting new emails we have we're being validated by society for that too mm-hmm. like that is where we're getting validation and admiration and success and like every a lot of things that we want we're getting from go mode so mm-hmm. it would be so easy to be in go mode all the time so these four things are going to help you increase the polarity Perfect. Number one. What is number one? <laughs> number one is to actually spend time apart from one another and encourage each other to grow as individuals. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your evolution in, within our relationship in this. Yeah, this seems so counterintuitive, like spend less time together to make the I mean, I guess it doesn't seem counterintuitive, but spending less time, like the heart grows fonder with distance, Mm -hmm. like it's kind of that thing. Um, I used to always think if like we weren't feeling connected, we should spend more time together so that we can get our connection back. Um, And you're very independent. I'm very like want to be together all the time. And so when I leaned into, you know, let's try this out, like let's let's spend some time apart and do our own thing. Um, that increased our polarity like we're talking about because I'm doing my own thing and then you'll be like, oh, do you want to hang out tonight? And I'm like, oh, I've got something going on. And there's this moment of like uncertainty for you of like, does she want to hang out with me? Like, you know, there's this like pang of, which is kind of good. Like, it's kind of good. Like, I'm my own person. You're your own person. We're going to progress as individuals. And there's this little bit of fear of like not wanting to be left behind or not wanting the other person to like grow too much Mm -hmm. and you want them to grow but you and then it forces you to want to grow too and that is just like there's something sexy about it like Mm -hmm. the the fear the uncertainty the the independence and of course like you don't want it all the way that way um but a little bit of that has definitely made things sexier in our relationship what was it like for you in the very beginning when i would encourage you to spend more time with friends or um, just encourage you to go out and like develop your own hobbies and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it was really painful for me at the beginning. I came from, um, I think my entire childhood was, um, I like my parents are amazing. So it's, it has nothing to do with my parents not being amazing, but my parents made a lot of decisions for me where I didn't have to make a lot of decisions for myself. I think a lot of, they also gave their opinion on everything that I did and I always wanted to please them. So then going into intimate relationships, I almost didn't know how to make decisions for myself and I always went to what does the relationship want? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to, like, I don't know where to go to dinner. What do you want to eat? I don't want to choose something that you don't want because I I don't even want that if you don't want it, Mm -hmm. you know? Like, that's my go-to. It's like, 
it doesn't really matter what I want to eat because I just want to do whatever you want to do. That's what I felt. And then when you were like, I just want you to do your own thing. I'm like, well, does that mean you don't love me? Does that mean you don't want to spend time with me? And it really, at first, I really didn't like it. It was very uncomfortable um, because I just didn't know what to do. I was like sitting with, I've never had this thing where I'm like, now I have to choose actually what do I want to do? Mm -hmm. I've never actually thought about it. Um, So it was really, really uncomfortable at first. And then when I actually did it, um, it became something that I crave. That you absolutely love. I absolutely love it. Yeah, love so, it. It's so funny. Uh, we did this. Uh, really, we just asked each other a question like, it, when do you feel, I think, when do you feel most free? And my answer was when, A, I can go, like I had just come back from Ireland for 12 days and I was completely disconnected. Uh, and my answer was like, when I know I can go I can go away for a while and you have no resentment and you actually encourage me to do this. It doesn't make me care about you or feel any less connected to you. It's actually the complete opposite. Mm-hmm. It makes me so grateful that I have the freedom to go out and continue to explore as an individual. And you don't have to go out and explore and worry about me. Yes. You're not away worrying that I'm a home alone sad, which at the beginning of our relationship I was. Mm-hmm. You left for Peru for two weeks at the beginning of our relationship and the whole two weeks you I was de- miserable. Literally depressed. Yeah. I was miserable and I'm sure being away, it's like it makes it harder for you to enjoy yourself away because you know I'm sad. Um, so I've definitely leaned into that and that's been a huge lesson for me of I am my own person mm-hmm. and that is important. And my response when you allow me those experiences is to give you what you more deeply want, which is together time. Mm -hmm. And I I really lean into it with zero resentment, right? It's just like a, it feels like a a perfect, perfect balance. And then I get the kind of attention that I want. Mm -hmm. There's even been times where, where it's gone a little bit too far in the other direction. And you're like, you're wanting together time. And Mm -hmm. that feels so good. Mm -hmm. That feels so good from my end. Um, It makes the together time you're giving it because you want to not because you know i'm asking ob- for it obligated yeah or something. there's no obligation there's no around guilt. it um and it took us a while to get there and it was just a lot of practicing of we would go and do something and then you would ask me if i wasn't here what would you want to do mm-hmm. and then i really think about it like if michael wasn't here what would i want to do and then i was building the muscle of figuring my own shit out for myself mm-hmm. And lastly on this piece is that after spending a significant, even just a few days apart, um, especially when one of us is unplugged and so we're not communicating the whole time, it's the best sex ever. And it's, I think even it is the best sex ever. That's really true. Um, Even when you go away and we are plugged, like we can reach out to each other because we are like very much understand that each other is an independent person and we want the other to grow as an individual we don't talk to each other that much Mm -hmm. i think we'll go some sometimes an entire day or two days without hearing from another and it's not that big of a deal like i'm you know i'm not just like holding out for some reason Mm -hmm. i'm probably doing something Mm -hmm. and you're probably doing something and we'll see each other when we see each other yep Number two is to continue treating each other like you're you're still courting right like you're dating this is this is not news to anyone, right? Everybody hears in some way or the other that you should have like a date night. Uh, but I think what we've discovered, I know what we've discovered recently is that it's not really enough just to like go on a date, go to the movies or go out to eat. Uh, if that works for you, that's awesome. But even in just a few years of, of being married, that doesn't feel completely fulfilling all the time. Well, I think it's, it's the the novelty thing. Mm-hmm. Like, you make me coffee every morning. And at first, it was like, this is so sweet. Oh, my gosh. Michael makes me coffee every morning. He loves me. He's courting me. I love it. It's so cute. And then now you just make me coffee every morning. It's, it turns into, like, an expectation more than anything, mm-hmm. right? So now if you don't make me coffee, I'm like, what the hell? Instead of it bringing me that that joy that it used to bring me it's the same thing with if your date nights are always the same Mm -hmm. if you're always going to the movies if you're always going to the same restaurant um that's comfort and security and safety um not what we're trying to do and talk about here which is like 
Spice it up. Spice it up. Exactly. So, and the courting is not the, not necessarily the exact things you were doing when you were courting mm-hmm. them, but just like the way that you wanted to treat this person. Mm-hmm. Like you wanted to surprise them. You wanted to delight them. You wanted to, you wanted to show that you're thinking about them in a moment that they don't expect you to be thinking about them. Yeah. Like that type of thing. Trying to impress them. Yes, exactly. So over the past three to six months, we've had two epic date nights and we're going to tell you these two stories just to maybe uh give you some ideas but just also show you what we mean by like surprising and delighting each other Mm -hmm. so the first one was on valentine's day um i told adi beforehand that i was going to take her on an epic surprise date night and or i was going to do i was going to do something great for her and i told her that she needed to be ready at seven with like a dress or something and like 10 minutes before seven, I told her, hey, I've got to run to the store <laughs> and I've got, to, I've got to pick up something. I'm going to cook you dinner. Mm-hmm. And what really happened is I drove to a hotel that I had booked for the night in Austin. And at seven o'clock sharp, someone knocked on our front door and was carrying flowers. And they also gave her, a, so they gave her the flowers and a note. And the note, I had I had written that note and I had written a series of other notes throughout the house uh, and put them throughout the house. And I put something sexual in each one of them. Um, <laughs> something a little dirty. Something a little dirty. <laughs> and each one, each note led her to another note throughout the house. And then mm-hmm. the final note, I said, be ready at this time. There's a car that's going to pick you up. Here's what you need to pack in your bag. And it's going to take you to this hotel. Mm-hmm. And um, honestly, I, I, I won't go into any more detail. That's that's about the yeah. We hung uh, out at the hotel and uh, went to dinner, and it was just like it was amazing. Right, and the feeling for both of us, for me, just like preparing for that whole event, like I was so so nervous that a she wouldn't have a good time, and b that I would mess something up. And that's the exact feeling that we had when we were started that when we were dating. Like I was trying to impress you all the time. I was I was I really wanted to make sure you were uh, happy and like having a an amazing time. And just those simple steps helped us have this incredible night with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um I then planned one for you. So the next one was me planning for you. I um told you what time that you needed to be somewhere. And I met you at the place. Which Actually, even before. We started talking about this probably a month earlier, and we mm-hmm. decided that we were going to get really dressed up. Mm-hmm. So we were going to dress something not like we I, – I, the instructions were dress in a way that you wouldn't normally dress, and then I dressed in a way that I wouldn't normally dress. And then um, one of the cool things is, like, it's just something small. This could be, like – these are a little bit grand ideas. Like, we're not doing this all the time. Um, but meeting at the date place instead of – me going there together I think changes the vibe because I was intentionally late so I was 15 minutes late Michael had to sit there for like 15 minutes like is she coming is she not coming like there's something about that I knew exactly what was going on I started laughing but didn't it kind of like give you this like butterflies in your stomach you know you have yeah you have this feeling of like oh this is exciting like I don't know when she's gonna come like that kind of feeling um just something little simple like that can just create this mystery or this excitement um, similar to when you guys were first starting to date. Mm -hmm. And she didn't mention this, but one of the biggest game changers and this, like we've we've done this a couple of times is that you wore a wig. Mm -hmm. You wore a different, different colored wig. What was that like for you? I mean, something about wigs just like makes me so excited and fun. And um, I think it's like, Immediately when I put it on, I'm like more playful and I'm flirtier and um, it's just like so different and so scandalous. Like it's like, oh my <laughs> gosh, like like it's so – is anyone going to know it's a wig? Like that type of feeling. Um, so it gets me like more in that vibe um, and I loved it. And I think one really important thing to note about these like date nights that you're doing, um, something really important is to limit the amount of responsibility that you have when you're going on these dates. So if you have kids, make sure the kids are taken care of and you don't have to be home by a specific Mm -hmm. time. Um, If you can, don't do this on a day where you don't have to work the next day or 
Uber to where you have to go so you don't have to find parking. Like the responsibility of having to find parking, to drive home, like as little responsibility as possible of needing to be certain places at certain times or being responsible for something is going to foster more of the atmosphere of spontaneity Mm -hmm. and uncertainty and mystery and excitement. Playfulness, kind of Mm -hmm. badness. Mm -hmm. That's all good for sex. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So number three is to talk about your sex life, right? We, We don't talk about it enough. And when we do, it's often wrapped up in a lot of shame and embarrassment and a lot of negative feelings. Right. And I think it's completely normal for those feelings to surface, but What's important is to actually talk about the feelings, talk about what's going on for you, talk about your desires, your fears, and just talk about your sex life. Yeah, I think that's real. And like with your partner, also talk about your sex life with your friends. Like talk about it, talk, just talk about what's going on more and more and more. Um, and like one question that you could use to start off the conversation could be, um, I love the question of, how long would it take for us to not have sex for you to feel like something's wrong? Um, and then you can start there. Like, if we only had sex once in two weeks, I would definitely be like, whoa, mm-hmm. what's up? Like, something's like something's going on. Mm-hmm. Like, what's going on? And knowing that, and then that can start a conversation of like, oh, let's make sure that doesn't happen. How do we make sure that doesn't happen? Um, but also, like, I think a lot of people – don't talk about sex which means that they don't talk about like does it feel good for you are you enjoying it is it are you getting what you want from it um do you want me to do different things like just asking oh i did this thing did you like that Mm -hmm. i think especially for me i don't know if this is that way for you but i will just like like whatever's going on in the bedroom like i'll just assume it's you're doing something you want to do and i might not like it but i'm like oh if he likes it i don't want to say anything Mm -hmm. Um, and just like do something that I don't necessarily like because I think we really like it. But right. oftentimes when we've talked about it, you've been like, oh, I don't even really like that. Mm-hmm. We don't ever need to do that again. <laughs> yes. And if I would have just said something, I could have saved myself some discomfort in a, in a such an intimate, vulnerable moment that should be just about pleasure and, and enjoying each other. Mm-hmm. I had a thought. I lost it. Oh, I think one of the best times to talk about sex is actually right after sex. Yes. Uh, because a lot of times you're feeling super connected. <clears throat> your walls are kind of down. You were just like super vulnerable with each other. And I think it could just be a really great time to have some of these conversations. Mm-hmm. Number four, uh, this is this is not really a strategy, just a mindset. It's to realize that sex is like anything else in life. It's going to ebb and flow. Um, If you're really intentional about your sex life, you're having conversations, you are courting each other, you're trying to delight each other over and over and over, you're going to have times where it just feels like it's on fire, Mm -hmm. right? But if you live in the same world that we live in, you're probably also going to go through periods where it it could feel stale. It, you could, you might not be having it as much. You might go through a period of time where you're working more. You have kids. You're you're more stressed out, and it's normal to have periods of time where your sex life isn't as uh, as strong or as as passionate as mm-hmm. it used to be. And I think the problem that this, so a lot of people think that it should be just incredible all the time. Because a lot, that's what's shown on the movies, in the mm-hmm. movies. And if it's not, then there's something wrong with the relationship. And I think that's a really big problem because nothing in life is permanent, right? There's no, like no state is permanent. So it will go through ebbs and flows. Totally. I couldn't have said it better myself. So just to wrap the, these up, guys. Number one, spend time apart from one another and actually encourage each other to grow as individuals. Usually this will be a lot easier and even automatic for one person in the, the what we call the I centered person in the relationship and it'll be harder for the other but we just encourage you to encourage each other to grow as individuals um, and to make it okay don't don't make them feel guilty for wanting alone time for wanting their own hobbies and for wanting space because it not only helps each individual experience life better but it also allows them to show up in the relationship. Better. Yeah. And have conversations, whoever <laughs> that we centered person is, have conversations around how that person can help you feel safe in 
um, being on your own and doing things independently because I know how difficult that is. And like just tell them how you're feeling, what your fears are around it so that together you can figure out um, how can I confidently and safely explore my own individuality Mm -hmm. um, having you as an ally instead of feeling like you're you're forcing me to do that because you want to spend less time with me. Mm-hmm. Number two is to court each other, surprise each other, delight each other. Uh, we we told you two stories about how we've really spiced up date night, but it doesn't have to all be about date night. It can be you know planning any activity or just surprising your person in any way that makes sense for you. And it could be as simple as sending a text message in the middle of a workday when you would not normally send them a message, just like about how much you love and appreciate them. Mm -hmm. And no one is ever going to hate that. So that could be like it, you know, just to like light up a fire inside that person and like Mm -hmm. make them feel those butterflies. Number three is to actually talk about your sex life. Uh, I know that it's a real, it can be a really sensitive topic. Uh, It's wrapped up in shame, guilt, and embarrassment a lot of times. And it's one of the most important things in relationships and in our lives as individuals. So get in there, have the vulnerable conversations and improve your sex life. Number four is, what is it? Realize that it ebbs and flows. So don't be attached to your sex life always being um, incredibly passionate and realize when you go through periods where it's stale or you're not having as much sex as you want, um, that this too shall pass. And if you're intentional about improving your sex life, um, you'll get back to where you want to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Later, guys. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Stay in touch by signing up for our newsletter at workingagainstgravity.com or on Instagram at workingagainstgravity. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, leave us a five-star review, and refer a friend. We'll be back next week with another episode. Talk to you then.